this and us ain't meshing. Yeah. And a big part of therapy, which I, I wish that a lot of people would understand, is that you shouldn't judge your success by other people's standards mm -hmm. when their standards aren't even applied to themselves. Nah. People will judge you by tougher standards than they would ever throw on themselves. Yeah. And, and I really mean this. The reason why they don't is because they know they can't live up to it. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, there's an expectation that you should. I don't think that that expectation is always malicious, mind you. Mm -hmm. Because I always think back to like, a parent wants the best for their child, but they're raising them in a certain way to make them kind of tough to be able to go out in the world to exist. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, you need to be better, you need to be smarter, you need to go to school, but you couldn't even live up to this. Yeah. And then, later on down the road, five, ten years from now, because I know that times change with technology, in my opinion. The newest thing, newest form of technology come out is going to change everybody's opinion on, on everything, right? Mm -hmm. People's standards fluctuate too much for you to live up to yeah. them. Yeah. The, the job application you applied to and got hired on is probably five years not going to be the same job application yeah. that they hired the same, uh, uh, the next person for your same position because times have changed. Another episode of Let's Off Monday here with my boy Dr. B. What's up, man? How you doing, boy? Number three. Let's go. Let's go. Here with my host, Jory. Jory, how you doing? I'm good. I'm a big fan of Dr. Jones. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Dr. B same, and Juice. Same, same. <laughs> I'm, a about you. I'm a fan of you too. You can definitely give it up for Dr. Thank Jones. You. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate you. She's doing a lot of great work in Carice. I'm a big I was happy to hear it. I met what I said her. Okay. Need a control group to figure out what the nuances are. Like, I would agree, yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah, but we on, keep, keep talking. <laughs> keep talking. Keep tell us about everything else that you've done. Yes, yeah, so right? I did the back to school braids event. We served about 12 girls. Mm -hmm. And the surprise, you know, one of the unexpected things that happened was one of the nail students from Dudley volunteered her time. And so the girls also got to get their nails done. Somebody donated book bags. Mm -hmm. and the girls also walk walked away with their book bags for mm -hmm. the first day of school. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I had put on the flyer, like, you need to come with your hair already washed and uh, blow dried so that we could get as many people in as possible. Mm -hmm. There was one girl that came mm -hmm. at, like, towards the end, like, maybe 1 o'clock. We accepted our last flight at, like, 2. Well, and she up. didn't have anything done, mm -hmm. like, but she looked like she needed it. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, fine. I'll just, like, shampoo clean you, blow dry you, and then we'll get you braided. And she rolled her sleeves up right here. Those <laughs> sleeves right here did that, right? <laughs> she rolled it up to wash that hair, okay? And so I'm shampooing her hair. She's telling me, like, oh, my gosh, thank you so much for taking me because I wasn't even going to go to school tomorrow if I didn't get my hair done. And then at the end, she got a book bag. She's like, oh my gosh, I was gonna use my book bag from eighth grade. She was starting high school. And so she was like, thank you so much. Like it, it just like transformed her whole attitude and experience for the next day. So it, you. it did, yeah. because like I said to Juice before, like I don't get to see the impact I'm having at work. Like I might see them again, I might not see them again. But in that moment, I saw like, yes, this is what the community needs and they appreciate what I'm doing. Um, so we're gonna do an extra tip. I always say, um, I just said to it, you know, on, oh, one of my clients on Friday. If you change one person's life, it was all worth it. Yeah. That's how I always look at it. Whenever I do a panel, a psychoeducation course, a seminar, if I changed one person's life, all of it was worth it. Yeah. I don't care what I had to do. I don't care if I had to spend $10,000 on it. If I changed one person's life, it, it was, was worth, worth it. Because I don't... Uh, spiritually, I don't know what pitfall I might have helped curb them from. Like, they might have been there with it. The devil might have got in and was like, this is it for you. Yeah. They might have shown up to your event and been like, you know what, God, if nothing positive happens today, I won't see you around. Right. Yeah. That little girl probably changed her whole trajectory of her life, probably. She probably take that experience with her moving forward and be like, you know, somebody did my hair, I should pay it for. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's why I say this, if this just would be one person, yeah. it was worth it. Because yeah. you don't know how that changes them goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, when it comes to these pinfalls that you speak on, what does a good mental health emergency plan of action look like? It depends on what you're dealing with. Okay. Like for instance, um, if you're dealing with suicide, there's always a suicide assessment. Like for instance, 
there comes a point in people's lives where they think about that as an option, but they don't they really entertain it. You know, life gets so hard that you hear the phrase like, sometimes I wish I wasn't. Yeah. You know, like, but that don't mean you really mean it. Right. Like, I, I've heard it in therapy where they all, because it's a therapist said more like, I don't really mean this doctor, but there's just times where I'm like, man, if I got hit by a car, I'm like, probably say, yeah, I'll be okay. With an assessment, an assessment would look like, well, if you were to do this, how would you do it? Mm-hmm. If they have an actual plan in place, and there are steps that you need to take to you before family members, you will follow me authorities, and you get them to go potentially check themselves into inpatient treatment so they can be monitored. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But a lot of things involve planning and using your support system that's there. I mean, you go talk to this person if something is bad, call this number, which is a suicide hotline, which I think are underutilized because with those hotlines, they have dedicated members around the clock able to stay on the phone mm-hmm. and talk to the person. So depends on the state. Depends on the state. You're right. I'm thinking mainly around in this area. Shout out to fill this in. Like, yeah. So the 988 number, is that what you're referring mm-hmm. to? Yes. That's like you dial it in your area and then somebody from that state response correct right. okay. and they can be on the phone with you to talk you through it because it's not uncommon that me and my brother will get calls of hey we're worried can you talk to this person and we have to tell them that that's a little tricky because you could be on the phone with them for a really 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 long time mm-hmm. and it's not that you don't care to be on the phone with them but you have other stuff that's kind of going on in your life that's why those numbers are very very useful because that person is able to set aside that time to talk yeah so I recently um, helped someone in North Carolina, and they had told me that they had texted the number, mm. and they showed me the messages, and it looked like they were talking to a computer. Yeah, that's part. And so it was just like it. At that the point, the person just gave up because like you're not really responding to my need. Mm. And so that that could be kind of frustrating if you're, you're at the point where you're ready to reach out for help, and then you don't even get like. Yeah, those well, certain resources that should be automated. Yeah. yeah. That is one of that. I saw it um, on Instagram yesterday, how a chat GPT, you can now talk to it. Mm-hmm. And one person said, I don't even need a therapist. I can just talk to chat GPT. <laughs> I think that's a problem. Yeah. Like, I, don't, I, I don't think AI will ever replace mental health therapy, but to what you two were just alluding to, right? Yeah. It's not a real human. The, the big mechanism in healing somebody with a mental health issue is the relationship you form with your therapist. That accounts for upwards of sixty percent of the healing process. It's not a therapy. It's not a tech. It's not a technique or an approach to therapy that does the heal. It's the non-judgmental environment you create with a person. Because most people have an experience or a space when you can come in, talk about everything, talk about your thoughts of death, talk about your insecurities and things like that. Yeah. I always say you hold it up between you and that person, and that person's not shying away from it or jumping you forward, and they're helping you hold it. And you look at it for the first time without somebody telling you put it away because other people's stress will stress you out. I don't want to talk about this. I'm talking about it right now. So you hold it up and you're both looking at it and you're analyzing it. And then you're coming to terms with it. You're no longer afraid of it. Or you thought it was one thing and it's actually another. You redefine it. That's why I don't think that certain things to what you two are saying <laughs> needs to be all. Yeah. You shouldn't. If someone's dealing with suicide, AI shouldn't be the thing to call to it. It should be a person. Yeah. And it goes into, I get the whole resources, people, things like that, but that's not something that yeah. should be all I need. That's not a value way of building. I'm gonna stay on the topic. I got more to ask you. Okay, so what does a mental health emergency for someone who's suicidal look like for someone who has community versus someone that doesn't have community as support? So with some of the last community, you really can have people rally around you. Yeah. You know, talk to uh, what you're, talk through what you're dealing with. Like, how do we get to this space, right? Because a lot of times, and I always say this, people want to be there for somebody, but they want to give unasked or unwarranted advice. You shouldn't do that. Just your presence of being there, listening to them, asking more questions, being curious. Having a support system means that you can talk to somebody about when you're having emotional struggle or coming to sit with you. Because a lot of times, if someone's flirting with the idea of potentially harming themselves, it is a cry for help. Yeah. They're, they're bringing it up, the sound of the alarm. I'm thinking of this, I'm thinking of that. They really want the help. Being with them, being there for them. That is the biggest difference when yeah. someone has a support system. 
I'm not alone in this. I can lean in with somebody. And when they do not have somebody, the interesting thing about your question is, I don't want it to sound philosophical, but you can have people around you and still feel like you have them. Yeah. yeah. That, that is a lot. So to account for the people who truly don't have a support system as far as no one around, but even with people around them and they feel like they can't be with someone, that's a whole lot different. There's a, a personal struggle where they're bearing the weight alone and day to day. And a lot of times, like I've heard people say in therapy sessions, uh, the only thing keeping me here is God and, and, and you, you there. That's it. Because it's a day to day struggle to be able to make it through a week. A lot of times with those people, what my experience has been is they lean on their spiritual foundation a lot, the thing that anchors them. Um, thinking about people, someone, there's always someone in your life that would be sad if you weren't here in the world. So we anchored to those things. But a big part of it was, I have one client, he's um, an older gentleman in the set. He was struggling with suicide age because he's having a lot of physical health issues. So not just isolation, actual suicide. Because there's a no, difference between you're, you're right. So no, he literally was just struggling with the thought of it. Like, and he never actually made an attempt to actually do it. He was struggling with the thought of it. And the thing that pulled him away from him, he has no issue with it to this day, at least when we talk about therapy, was he increased his belief system. The days of ever school. Yes, sure can. Yeah. Sorry, and moving around a lot. I right, cool. And my husband, are you all? Are you? He's he's in it. He's in it. He's in it. Hey, I saw that got you. Don't keep falling. Just keep talking. I'm trying to make sure guys. I got you. Keep talking. But uh, <laughs> leaning into his faith helped him to come back from that a whole lot. He'll tell you to this day he has no concern about it no more, and not morbidly. But if he was to pass and transition from this health issue, he said, I feel like I'm going to be okay. Mm -hmm. So those are the two juxtaposed positions where you have people who can come and sit with you, okay. be with you, talk to you, motivate you and encourage you. That is a big thing. Yeah. The motivation and encouraging you, reminding you that you mean something versus I don't have that. So I got to find it elsewhere. And the reason why I think that, um, using your faith because that kind of helps is because I can only speak to Christianity, but in the scripture, it tells you that there's a lot of positive things about who you are as a human being. As a child of God, you are loved. You may feel low, but you're never lonely. You, there are angels praying for you. God is watching you. You can pray and talk. And those are the key themes that tends to help people when they're alone and they have that. Yeah. I just thought of something and it may or may not exist, but what if there was like a group kind of like AA, but like for people who are struggling with SI, like, oh, that is a community, if you, especially if you're alone, at least you can come to this one place and everybody could talk honestly about what it's like to be in that space. Do you think that would be helpful or do you think they would like feed off of each other and then? No, I think it would, I think it would be helpful because I know in inpatient treatment facilities, like if you check in for one of those, they have some form of group therapy for that. I think group therapy is really, really powerful because if I am the clinician is sitting around with a group of people, you might not believe what I'm saying because I haven't gone through a struggle. Like there, the only other people other than therapists are pastors that I can think about where they tend to the community in a way and people look at them and go, you ain't got no problems, you got it all figured out, right? Like Dr. Jones, you got it all figured out. What you know about right. is you know, like you don't have a backstory, like you ain't been through it. Right. Like, yeah. But when you put them around other people, the advice that this person may give resonates with the group because they go, All right, you know, I'm, I might try it. Mm -hmm. You you've been through it. Yeah. You know what it's like on the other side. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I'll try that. So I think that group based platforms, period, help when there's a shared issue among the group. I do believe in it. When you do inpatient care, they do give you a form of group therapy and individual therapy to help you work with the issue because how the group model works. Yeah. You might not believe it coming from me because you might have a perception of me as I don't have a problem. Mm -hmm. But if one person or the leader of the group has overcome the same issue, it resonates with the group. Yeah. Because then it's like I'm, I'm talking to someone who can, at the bare minimum, maybe not fully understand, but can really wait toward a little ember. Yeah. 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 Um, ironically, I just released a episode titled, How Did Alcohol Hurt? And we talk about group therapy and a guy who I did a sit down with, shout out to Frankie. 
he actually leads a group therapy circle as someone yep. who was an alcoholic, who's still an alcoholic, but doing better than he was now. And he brought up the fact that when it comes to group therapy, the most powerful thing you can have is the person who leads the group has gone through what we were all through and, and how impactful that is. That is a thousand percent true. Because like I said earlier, they can look at it. him leading the group would do a lot more good than the therapist leading the group. Therapists can come in and just give education on why this approach would work and everything else. But him doing it is more impactful is because they can see, they see them in him and they see what the other side of it looks like through them. It's kind of like um, I was invited to go talk to a, a DC prison to a group of people that were incarcerated recently. And the speakers who came to speak were former inmates. They resonated with their message more because they can speak to that whole experience. So it's easy to be on the outside looking in saying, you should do this, you should do that, it'll be okay. But when you were in it and you come out of it, it hits more when it goes, you will be okay. Because I tried X, Y, and Z, maybe you could try it. Okay, I'll listen. Because you know what, you, 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 you described what I went through. In that example, you described the craving, the depression, the sadness, and how the ruin in my family, how I feel like I'm so, all down with stress that I need another drink, but you managed to come out on the other side yeah. and make something that you, I'll listen to. Yeah. Or how you really did promise to be better. You wanted to be better, then you backtracked, though. Oh, and yeah. that too. Point, you know, we all know what backtrack looks like when we wanted better, and we still gave in to the addiction. Mm -hmm. And then also finding out that the addiction is never the focus. The actual reason usually has to do with something emotional that happened to you, whether it's the mismanagement of emotions, the mismanagement of trusting others, or just other things you didn't know were related to whatever you're going through directly. Yeah, addiction is a tricky thing. Um, uh, it's a real tricky thing to deal with. Not to go off top, but the data on topics are you. Okay, I'll keep, keep. So addiction is really, really tricky because even within the, the sphere of mental health, because there are people who believe that it is a choice. I'm not gonna parse out whether somebody wants to believe that or not, that's on them. Um, but I actually do I enjoy studying the brain. So the tricky thing about the addiction from my perspective of studying the brain is that there's a part of your brain called the nucleus of company that regulates dopamine. This is why I say that certain chemicals, it's, it's beyond that person's control. The, the dangerous part about an addiction is the craving. It's not even the actual substance itself. And I'm gonna get into what I mean by that, it's really managing the cravings, the dangerous part, because once you take a powerful substance like crack, heroin, fentanyl, whatever it is, your brain releases all of this dopamine because of it. Like you might've got joy with petting your dog, hanging out with your friends, playing video games, but all of a sudden you take this and out, your brain goes, oh wow, we want more of that. The crazy thing is, your brain, your nucleus is coming because it wants more. You won't even get the same pleasure out playing a video game, petting your dog, kicking it with your friends. You'll get a whole lot of what we call anticipatory dopamine just by thinking about it. Yeah. You get a whole, your, your nucleus is coming be like, man, I can't wait for us to get it. It's going to feel like this. All that dopamine. Yeah. So the next thing you know, you're fight. You said what? That's how I have with the gem. Right. Yeah. It, it, that's a fair example right there as well, right? Yeah. It's the same concept, just on a broader scale. So now you're going through the day fighting it, fighting it, fighting it, and your brain keeps dumping all this dopamine in your system with you imagining it that you can't resist the number when you need. The craving has hit. You're out there doing things to get it. Then you go and get the substance and your brain doesn't produce nowhere near as much dopamine as it did when you were thinking about it or the first time you took it. That's what leads people to upping the dosage and leads them to OD. That's why I say dope, uh, an addiction, that's a different animal. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, a whole different type of feast. You do need mental health therapy and also to certain levels, you're gonna need medication with it because in order to produce brain change, we have to deal with things in the inner medium. So when I say brain change, I'm always referring to therapy. In order to change certain areas of the brain, to change the way you think, to change new habits, you need a little bit of assistance in between. It's not that you fully need it every single time, but addiction is a different type of myth. 
well, what about for people who are overachievers and they don't get the fix they deserve after accomplishing so much? That's more of a, if you want my eyes opinion, how, you, how I'm interpreting it is, that yeah. that's more of an esteem or it's, oh, a security issue. Oh, yeah. Like, for instance, if you can't be happy with the milestone you just get to the point where you got to celebrate it mm-hmm. and you're thinking about what the next thing is, I would say that why are you letting your achievements define you so much? There's nothing wrong with hitting a milestone. Don't get me wrong, right? Yeah. But it's something in the way that blocks you from sitting with that a little bit. Because you're just jumping from the next milestone to the next. Now, you could argue and say, well, Dr. B, that's how somebody stays motivated. That's how they don't get bored. But yeah, then I'll honor that. If that's how you look at it, perfectly fine. As long as it's not impeding or hindering your life. But to answer your question, I would say that that's more of an esteem thing because it sounds like what you're describing is you define your success or your happiness or if you could check this item off the list and achieve this thing. That's how I would answer that. Now, we could get dopamine from achieving things, absolutely. 100% you could. Believe it or not, dopamine is a it's a powerful chemical because what is it? dopamine turns into adrenaline. Yeah, that's the other part of the depiction about left out. When you think about all of the things you can give once you get that substance, the dopamine turns into epinephrine, which then now motivates you. You now have the energy right. to go and do it. I hope that answered your question, because that's why I said, like, if it's helping you in life achieve your goals and you're not defining yourself by your achievements, I see nothing wrong with that because you're getting hit with dopamine. Now, if you get a good enough idea, it turns into adrenaline. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and go do it. Mm-hmm. So then the reason that's important, right, is I have to practice celebrating myself. Oh, like after doing things, I'm like, hey, man, like I'll feel myself be like, all right, we got all these other things to do. And it's like, hey, 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 buddy, go get you a pizza. I was worried if I was the only one where he just hit a nerve and I was just like, well, I don't want to raise my hand. <laughs> no, 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 it's all right. No, no, it's good. I was talking talk about myself. <laughs> I'm talking the room for the first two. That's why I'm saying I can answer this question. Because I, I had this sick, I kind of literally, I finished my PhD program and said, uh, there's more. I got to go do something. And I had to sit with myself and go, yeah, why can't I just sit with this? Yeah. Like, why, why can I not just sit with, I just finished it. It took me a long time while I finished it. Yes. I was ready to jump to the next task because my success was defining. Yeah. It was an insecure. I don't actually, I don't mind talking about it. Uh, it was a, I've always struggled with insecurity. Mm-hmm. Uh, doing self reflection from doing therapy and meditating to. I think me and you just talked about it. So mm-hmm. I had to talk about this with you. It's very rare that doing you know, therapy, I give somebody a technique that I don't do on myself. I'm a, I have a, it's my personal philosophy that. I don't recommend things unless I try. And when I do recommend things to a client, I tell them, hey, if it don't work, come back and talk to me. We can troubleshoot it together. So the one thing that I always advocate is meditating. Mm -hmm. I believe that meditating because it it strengthens key areas of the brain. The key areas of the brain that meditation can strengthen and most people struggle with is it's your interior singular cortex, your ACC. What is that mind? It's very simple. It detects discrepancies and helps deal with emotional regulation. So when you go, I need to do this task today, and then you wander off and go do something else for hours and more, that's the part of the brain that goes, hey, didn't you say Mm -hmm. you need to do this task? It's your accountability. Correct. Thank you so much. The part of your brain that deals with accountability, and also when you say, I don't want to be angry and volatile. Well, it's the part of your brain that goes, yeah, let's hold you accountable and bring you back now. So meditation strength is that. Your prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that encompasses your personality, that does all the executive thinking, you set a goal when you want to do this, when you want to be this way, it strengthens that. Because we said earlier that a lot of mental health is the upper part of your brain trying to calm down the limbic or lower reactionary part of your brain. When you meditate, it strengthens that upper part of that brain. So that way, when you go, okay, now I'll go into this office today, cut some coworkers out. That's the part of the, it literally goes, cool, we'll hold you to that. And when your body starts clearing up, it's now strong enough because you've worked that muscle of meditating to go, all right, let's calm down. We said we wasn't going to cuss nobody out today. Or I'm not going to be as reactive in my relationships. Let's calm down. So I say that to say, 
And in the midst of me doing all that, I had to sit with my own emotions and go, am I reacting? Why do I feel like this is not good enough? I was like, oh, I'm letting my achievements define me because I've never felt good enough growing up. There's two things Dr. P struggles with. It was insecurity uh, and anxiety. Because of where I grew up at Washington, D.C., I never felt like safe. So when I was growing up, my go-to was I turned fear and uncertainty into pressure because I was like, well, you're not about to play with me. Right. You're not about to get the better of me. We're not doing that out here. It took me years of me working with my own self and seeing my own therapist to come to terms with that. So that's why earlier when it was like, well, if you can't do with achievements, I was like, oh, I can't answer that because that's, <laughs> yeah. that's how I, I kept jumping to the next task to the yeah. next. So mm-hmm. that's why I was there. That's how, how yeah. I get Did you feel like your... Uh, mom or dad made you need to achieve. I feel like that's probably where mine comes from. Like, I have to do well, or they're gonna say I need to be better. Or I'm trying to be a doctor at age 12, and I'm the first one to do it, so I have to do it, or else I'm like a failure. Or yeah, I went to med school and I'm a pediatrician now. And the reason I became a pediatrician is because this black boy was murdered and the doctors were abusing his body. And so I have to get back to the community. So if I don't change the way that the community operates, then that's a failure. And I realize that's a huge weight to put on myself, right? Um, I have to be mindful and remind myself like, yes, that one girl said that she wasn't gonna go to school and I did her hair for her and she felt better. So that's, like you said, that that changed one life. And so that was the impact that was needed, but like, I forget where, where I'm just going with this. But you had you you had addicts though. Oh, was your your the way your parents interacted with you was that the reason why you felt like you needed to achieve? The answer to that is yes, but it's the opposite direction. I feel of where you were, where you were saying that they would like, you could do this, but you could do better. If you don't do this, you need to do this, right? Mine's was different. It's my dad is my hero. I love that guy. I love him to death. That's my number one guy I love in this world. But I never. I it was very rare I heard good child. I was very rare I heard good job. I didn't, matter of fact, I didn't hear good job from him until I hit my 30s. Mm. Yeah, that's, what, that's the first time I could vividly remember. So I was always doing things to hear good jobs. I got told I, I was bad growing up. I was really, really, I ain't gonna lie. I ain't gonna pay that. I was a bad kid. My mother sent me to live with my dad because I was getting out of hand. I wanted to do good red stuff with my good rap friends. it was it, fun. It was fun. Yeah. 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 My mother was like, no, nope, yeah. you take him and deal with him. So, and he did a great thing. He did a good job, great job, in my opinion, of uh, providing the structure and everything else. But I never felt like I was getting that good job. Yeah. Never. So I think that if I'm reflecting upon myself, I feel like it came from that. Yeah. I kept doing those things because I'm looking to be told, mm-hmm. good job. But then when I became a adult, the reason why I never fully overcame it until recently was even when I was doing a good job, I was always told, be it from the military and everything else, there's always something else. No need to sit yeah. and celebrate this. You got something else to do. All right, good, good work. Yeah. Next Back task coming yeah. up. So yeah. it became a more yeah. like a negative feedback. Yeah. yeah. My dad was similar. Like, I would get all A's on my report card and he was like, oh, I don't care about the right side of the report card. I care about the left side. Mm. They would talk about like your attitude or like mm. if you were sharing and so it's like, dang. The Bobos. To that point, I, yes. I, I always do with my daughter, I do the compliment sandwich whenever I'm correcting. Hey, the grades are getting better. You're still late to these two classes. Yeah. What's going on? But I like that your grades get better because human beings, our brains are wired. We have a negative bias. For all the good we do, we hyper-focus on the wrong for whatever reason it is. And I always try to be mindful of when I'm correcting my own child that, one, I always I feel like I overdo the compliment because I was starved of it as a child. And so I tell them, you're doing a great job. You're doing a good job. Fix this. Yeah. But you're still doing a great job no matter what go out. Cause she's an athlete like her dad is. I'm like, you go out there and kick, you crush everybody. Yes. Yeah. And when she messed up, I'm like, yeah, you did. But you said it was a point, but you got a little cocky right there. We need to change that. To your point, yeah, um, and I was going somewhere with that, uh, Dr. Jones, I was. I forgot for two of my dad. Just keep thinking. It'll, it'll come back. Hold on one second. It was something you said that made we go there. Oh, you don't care about the left side. There we go. Yeah. That's where it was, yeah. Cause it's the, it's, there has to be a, balance that I think our parents didn't realize. Mm-hmm. And I, I think they had good intentions, right? Yeah. Because they were trying to prepare us for the, this world when we were doing this black people. Yeah. And you, you did good. Yeah. 
But this right here is what they're going to look at. They weren't wrong, but you got to balance it out a little bit like this. My dad used to always have the sprays. He never, he said, I'm never going to what we're doing, right? Because you should be doing right regardless. Man. And I was always like, well, well, dang. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> if I go to work, they pay me. Yeah. And if I do a good enough job, they get bonuses yeah. sometimes. Right? What, what type of philosophy yeah. is that? That's so, also so you inheriting the Trump. Correct. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. It's like, so for me, I think if I had an example, I was always the nail in my parents' lives and they were taking turns to be the hampers. Mm. Of like, I, how could we knock you in here? How could we do this? Oh, you're putting on some weight. Where do we have to put you into? Okay, all right. So like, I don't- That's really sad. Can we pause on that? You were the nail and they were the hammer. Yeah, that was good. Really, really good right there. So like, I think <laughs> for me, yeah. I've always done a good job of readjusting and saying, hey, it's not your job to make them proud. Mm -hmm. That's where I come from. Like, what do I do to make myself proud? And what does that look like for me? And what do I do to accomplish those things for myself? Because if you're in a room full of people who will no matter what you do, it's never good enough for them. At a certain point, they're not going to be at the room anymore. So who are you for yourself? And I had to let that really early. And it's not that they did it intentionally. I think they had a lot of hopes for me. And those hopes came out in commentary that I didn't need to hear or speaking on things that actually didn't have to do with the subject or how handling like a C or a C plus gets you smacked in the face versus, well, that was the best I had at that time. So if I'm not gonna get appreciation for this, why would I ever care about whether you like the fact that I got it A or not? And then just going from there. You, I mean, I love, I mean, I, you said a lot of good information right now. <laughs> so serious, like you get, uh, there's this thing called conditions of worth yeah. that you develop as you grow up. like. What conditions do I need to meet to prove that I'm worthy, right? Mm -hmm. So therefore you would code them in yourself. And there was something you said, I'm gonna paraphrase it a little bit, is like trying to live up to other people's standards where you won't even be there later on or down the road, it's, it's pointless. Human being standards, they shift given the times. Like a lot of times people come to therapy because those conditions of worth are out of whack with how they view themselves. They just, their emotions are now in a place to let them know like, something's off yeah. like this and us ain't meshing yeah. and a big part of therapy which I, I wish that a lot of people would understand is that you shouldn't judge your success by other people's standards mm -hmm. when their standards aren't even applied to themselves nah. people would judge you by tougher standards than they would ever throw on themselves yeah. and, the, and I really mean this the reason why they don't is because they know they can't live up to it but for some reason there's an expectation that you should. I don't think that that expectation is always malicious, my you know, mm -hmm. because I always think back to like a parent wants the best for their child, but they're raising them in a certain way to make them kind of tough to be able to go out in the world to exist. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, you need to be better. You need to be smarter. You need to go to school, but you could even live up to this. Yeah. And then later on down the road, five, ten years from now, because I know that times change with technology, in my opinion. The newest thing, newest form of technology come out is going to change everybody's opinion on, on everything, right? And then people's standards fluctuate too much for you to live up to yeah. that. Yeah. The, the job application you applied to and got hired on is probably five years, not going to be the same job application yeah. that they hired the same, uh, uh, the next person for your same position because times have changed. And I thought that what you said was really, really powerful because you got to figure out how to make yourself happy with who you are. Of course, I want my lady, my daughter, and my family to be proud of me. But you gotta do the work internally to recognize it yourself. Okay, I didn't achieve that mark, but I'm still good. I'm still yeah. worth love. Yeah. Like, you not gonna tell me that I'm not worthy of love because I didn't finish med school a year earlier than you yeah. thought I should. Yeah. Or all I had at the time was see worthy for that uh, for that class. Now I'm an A student and they're like, give me a break. I, 15 years ago, I just got to this point. Yeah. Now I'm learning high school, whatever that subject was. Yeah. Like I, I just got here 15 years ago. Yeah. You've been here 30 years, you barely speak English correctly. Like, hey, who cut me some slack? That's why I thought what you said was really, really powerful. I think you are emotional, a very highly emotionally intelligent child. Like 
for you to let go of the inner voice of your parents at a young age, like some people are still walking around that in 40, 50. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I tell you, I say that the voices are still there. My mom's more than my dad's, but like, even when that voice decides to like have an opinion, I usually ask that voice like, okay, well, from the thing that you want me to do, what are we supposed to accomplish with the things you want me to do? Because like, if the things you want me to do is the voice that's floating around in my head, does it get me closer to my goal or doesn't actually have structure in terms of how we get there and you want me to do this thing just to do it, it's still not for me. Like the ghosts are always going to be in your head. The part of the conversation that really needs to be had is what kind of relationships do you have with those voices and how much of yourself are you actually standing up for? Versus how much are you letting yourself get bent at these conversations and things that are happening? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I could see how that played out in a lot of different situations, like getting tough. So if a beating happened or my parents decided this isn't good enough, and being like, all right, so I could fake whatever habits here and then go back to get it back to, all right, how do we accomplish what we want to accomplish? So, like, for example, college football or football just in general my mom was like you're gonna quit that first week and i was like so why would you ever see that yeah and i was like oh that's all of you i need i was like oh this is what it feels like when someone tells you you can't do something you're gonna do it now and then even if you don't like the sport which i didn't like football for the first two years sticking with it until realizing okay there is something i enjoy about this process that i don't want to let go is simply seeing it through because this is what I genuinely want for myself. Yeah. You didn't like football for the first two years. Why did football? Why did you try out? My dad watched football. I wanted to like Will to I wanted to figure out what does he like about this sport so much that he's never played because he's Jamaican. And then like I played the sport and that first year was terrible. I had like wide receivers put me on my ass and I was heavier than them. You know, mm. it's like to be a heavy kid. A wide receiver put you on your ass. So that's crazy. That's crazy. That's you gotta, you gotta really have a, a lot of coming to Jesus moments with yourself. Like, nah, I ain't, I ain't gonna let him do it. And I, I went into the weight room. When you're, all right, so when, as a kid, developmental-wise, if you're put in the weight room to lose weight, your training to lose weight is very different for someone who's training to get stronger. Yep. Right, because when you're training to get stronger, you come in thinking, "I need muscle. What is this muscle going to be used for?" That t that dictates what lifts you're going to do. That also dictates after you lift, how are you going to use this muscle and repetition to build yourself up? I was a kid who was fat by like fifth or sixth grade. I was putting on a lot of weight. So by the time I got put in the gym in seventh grade, it became you need to go to the gym. You need to lose weight. You're just a kid that's floating around in the gym, just pitting things up, putting them down, walking on treadmills, riding on bikes. And your parents, my dad was fast as hell. He was actually extremely athletic, but he wasn't really around or accessible because he was raising my sister and my Claire. So if you have someone who's like super athletic, sometimes they think, well, you're my son. You'll just figure it out. But if you're not figuring out, you don't think to yourself, hey, maybe I should sit him down and be like, hey, this is what you're working on. He never did that. So really? I'm just like... In that household, I was the first kid between the both of them. I have an older sister, Tamara, shout out to her. I have a younger sister, two sisters, Nicole and Kimo. Uh, one sister, she's the Irish twin, we were raised separately. That's uh, Nicole and Kimo came after. I got you. Yeah, so I was the main one inside the household. That's essentially like, an only child. Yeah, that, yeah, that phrase, uh, you figure it out, you, you normally hear that with older, the oldest. Okay. Yeah, so like, well, he'll figure it out. Yeah, you'll figure it out. Yeah, because it's like, I, I, yeah. I don't know. I don't know what it's, yeah, he'll figure it out. <laughs> there, was, there was no advice. I just remember there is, when I look back at my life, there were like a lot of adults who I think the only thing they had to give was well wishes. But in the belief section, I know my parents believed in me, but belief is supposed to have an action behind it. Mm -hmm. And your action is usually the algamation of what they actually believe in. So for my parents, they believe, hey, he'll get that job that we want him to get, or that we think are good for him. But I don't really think there was a lot of, oh, you're training? Cool, let's talk about this. What's your training look like? I think yeah. from my parents asking about my training when I did pro trials or when I did football was, oh, is he working on it? Cool, let me leave him alone or not. Oh, I've been there before. Maybe there's something I can add to this. And I don't know if that ever came from a place of, 
being afraid to touch something that someone else is working on or having fear that if I don't accomplish the thing that I'm looking to accomplish with their advice, they'll feel like a failure themselves. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you do have to acknowledge that like adults have this big fear that you don't hear about until like a decade later if oh, you're yeah. lucky. So yeah. Especially if you're lucky, because that's a lot of negative messaging though. Mm -hmm. to, you mean towards me? Oh yeah, no, I'm aware. I'm aware. I'd be, I'd be, I'd be in, in the bed at nighttime looking out the window like, nah, I'm good. I know what to do. Yeah, or I know what not to do. But sometimes you got to blend in until you figure things out and build up to where you need to be, so. I think a common misconception amongst parents of children who are overweight is that you need to get them in the gym. No, you need to change what they're eating because they're still growing. Say that again. The misconception is that you need to get in the gym. No, you need to change what your child is eating because yeah. you what? can go to the gym and then still come home and eat Cheetos yes. and eat yeah. portions at dinner time and think that you're going to make a difference. Yeah, and I think also another thing, though, is you have to make eating exciting. I realized that after becoming an adult, food for my parents was just food and I don't, outside of the holidays, I don't remember, and I'm Jamaican, I mind what everybody wants to eat, right? I remember there were certain days that like, it was, hey, don't eat this, don't eat that. But when you were eating the things, oh, you might be eating too much. And then when the thing that's good for you becomes negative and the thing that's bad for you becomes negative, you can just stop listening to the rule, period. Yeah. So, and this was around the time period where if you were heavy, you were viewed as stronger being heavy. So I put on weight because I'm like, look, you need to get strong, you need to put on some weight. That's just what it is. Like, don't get me wrong. I worked really hard to get the body that I wanted it to get stronger, to be explosive. But like now looking back at it, I'm like, you guys, we, not just them, like myself included, we could have done a better job of making food more exciting and enjoyable and something to look forward to in the change instead of everything being negative and they're not there yet. Yeah. So like for every time my mom was like, oh, you should drink a smoothie, drink a smoothie. It's like, what is this demand to drink a smoothie? If someone sold me something like that, I wouldn't even look at the product. First of all, yeah. we shouldn't drink a smoothie. Let's do it together. Yeah. Right? Yeah. The other thing is like, you can't put the onus on the child for being overweight. Yeah. Like, yeah. why would you put cookies in front of him and say, don't eat the cookies? Like, no, and stop Josh, buying. Josh had that down pack. You remember what you oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, stop yeah. buying the cookies. And yeah. I have, a, I always say to the patients, parents, like, if I have a choice between an apple and ice cream, I'm going for the ice cream every single oh, time. Yeah, like, you can't yeah. put that on a 10 year old or 11 or 12 or 15 year old. Like, they're just not yeah. in a place to make those good decisions. So yeah. I've done it before then as their parent. Yeah. And even when I went home for my mom's birthday, I let them know. And I was like, you know, everything I say, my parents know when I joke around, I care about them. Like I'm not, if you're getting older at some point, someone's going to have to wipe your ass. I feel like that's a conversation everyone should just be comfortable with as a kid for their parents. Cause they, they getting old. You feel what I'm saying? You got the diapers conversation going to be, Hey, what's that smell? Oh, fart. What's going on? Who's my control stuff? <laughs> it's, it's a part of life. Like we need to like, we should all in our generation be ready for the fact that being the caretaker for your parents means you need to be ready to truly take care of them and not just say, hey, I paid your bill, you good. And no, because they're literally going through deterioration periods where the things that used to work don't work anymore. And as their kids, we're supposed to make space to be like, hey, are you okay? What's going on? And also... We have to be careful to not let our parents cover things up. And then when they become an emergency or they become something serious, we're not able to take care of it yeah. because they didn't want to have the conversation with us about what's no longer working with that. Yeah. Had this moment when I went home. You feel what I'm saying? So I tell them, like, I don't think you guys have done a good job of figuring out what actually makes me tick and what I enjoy because you guys want me to be all these things. And my mom's like, no, nah, I just want you to be happy. It's like, nah, if you wanted me to be happy, that would have started a decade as a change ago. Yeah, people have a, yeah. when you, there's three things. When you interact with people you know for a long time, they have, a, I'm gonna use this metaphor, bots that they have you with. And this is what you expect them to do. Yeah. So when people come to therapy and they work on themselves, they start coming out of that box and behaving differently. And then that's when you hear phrases like, 
you're acting different or why are you like this? No, you're you're saying that and using these behaviors to get me to go back into that box so that way I'm predictable to yeah. you. Me being in that box makes you comfortable where I am. So to your point, I just wanted you to be happy. Yeah, you wanted me, me to be happy according to your vision of what happiness for me looks like. Mm -hmm. And then that's a point where you gotta, they have to reconcile that with you, yeah. right? No, I'm gonna be happy according to my life. I'm not gonna go off and do what you thought I wanted to do, I wanna do something else. Yeah. So in that regard, yes, that's why when I hear that phrase, like, I just, you're being different, I want you to do this. That's what you wanted me to do, not what I wanna be for myself. Yeah. The other thing you said I liked was that, yes, you do have to get comfortable with the idea of being your parents caregiver. And I said it because I watched my dad do that with my granddad. I watched him go to work, come home, put him in the tub, wash him, feed him, things like that. So I'm looking forward to that, to give that back. I'm mentally prepared in my head, like, yeah, nah, we get, a, get another room in this house. Yeah. I'll make sure I wash him, you know, clean him up, brush his teeth, whatever it takes. Because I've worked with clients who have real serious physical disabilities. And what I've learned from working with them that I never considered as an able-bodied person is like, there's an internal suffering, like you were saying, like your joints and your limbs or disease is kicked in and you can't move the way you move. You're suffering internally. You can, you're you like crying out in your own head and no one can hear you. It's difficult to go from, I'm walking, helping me, lonely, running, doing the things I love. And next thing you know, something to fix the nerves in your legs so you can't move below your knees. No yeah. Way. And then in that situation, what most people know, I, I, I think they know, but they're not aware of the daily struggle of that person. I want to be a bird to my family. And then I don't want to hinder y'all. And yeah. I don't want to impact y'all. I don't want to soil you now. So they suffer even more in some of us. And they're not going to speak up on the issue. Oh, I don't want to talk about this. I didn't want you to worry. What do you mean? It's my job as your child to worry. Of course, I want to worry about it. Like, I, I've had clients that when I have to meet today, uh, they they knew their parents were sick. They knew something was off. They, their parents were like, I'm fine. I'm okay. I was like, all right, I trust you. And then it was worse than what they thought it was. And then they ended up going to glory to come and pass away. And then they come to think of it and like, I wish I would have pressed harder. I wish I would have forced them to tell. I wish I would have been like, no, you go to the doctor, you put them on the phone with me right now. Yeah. Or oh, I'll be there. And we're going, I wish I would have followed up to your point. I thought that was beautiful what you laid out because we're only getting older. Yeah. When we getting younger, the people who took care of us are gonna need us more. Mm -hmm. And you gotta be willing to have those conversations because if you don't, if you don't make it comfortable for them to believe you that you can you it's repetition at that point. Yeah. You can come to me and you can tell me I'm old enough to handle it. They're not. They're gonna look at everything you got going on, all your stresses and be like, I don't wanna worry you out. Yeah. You got so much going on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or you got people who accept that they just wear people out and that's who they are. My mom's a great example of that. Right. Mm -hmm. So when I was, I told you about the old, my mom had me trying to move over and stuff. Yeah. The basement and stuff. Right. You have to make sure your parents hear what you're saying and not only hear your rejection to what they're saying. Mm -hmm. So when I came home from my mom's birthday, all of a sudden me within like an hour of me waking up, turned it to, oh, I need you to move these boxes out of the basement into the garage. Cause dad and I me to go through it to throw things out as i was moving the boxes and putting it together i looked outside we have like a whole construction project that's happening to the house they're like changing panels they're changing um the rooftop there's a big dumpster that's in front that's blocking the entrance to take the stuff out and even the entrance in front of that entrance you have to step on like bricks that's this high after you put the containers on the bricks to walk across brass mud wood nails the dumpster and other things that's obstructing it. and i'm like that's not safe why would i walk through something that's not safe to move this right now why are we moving this right now why wasn't there a heads up if i'm here to celebrate you i'm not here to be mr strong man i'm here to celebrate my mom and talk to her right but she's here to make me well she's she was put me to work and i'm like slavery's over buddy you're gonna have to talk to me about this later now, what I offered as the middle ground is, hey, 
let me know what week after this week you want me to come back home to New Jersey and I'll pull up and help you out. So I'm not saying I'm not helping you out at all. I'm saying this isn't the right time to be doing this shit. That's a good boundary right there. You, know, you want to know what she did? I went to my dad. He didn't want to move the thing that I told him to move. That's not what I said. And, and, and I can't believe it. He told me, he told me uh, when he dropped me off back at Penn Station when I took the truck back. He's like, do you, could you believe she complained to me about that five different times? About you not wanting to move the boxes? Now here's the caveat. I called him because when I opened the boxes, I saw a lot of his records and DVDs. And he told me, no, I'm not trying to throw that out. I have no idea why she's trying to throw that out. He's like, actually, could you believe that she threw out, she moved some of my books into the garages, books that I haven't read yet? Because he's really big on reading books. I like how your eyes got wide because you feel where he's coming from. Mm -hmm. And he was reading. like, when I ask where the books are, she doesn't even know the books are in the garage. And I'm like, you, you have a husband and your husband has you. Even if you guys don't have a good relationship, when you start touching other people's things and moving things, and it turns into I don't have access to stuff, that's a situation. And now you're putting me in position to help that situation get worse. Because that's not what teamwork looks like. Even if you're hyper independent or you feel, oh, he can't get it done. Well, he has three pulled vertebrae in his back. He's not really supposed to be lifting things. Technically, you should be hitting me up and I should be hitting all my friends up around the way and seeing if we could all come together to help you guys out. But you're forcing the, well, if it doesn't get done now, it'll never get done. I'll do it myself. And it's like, that's who you're going to be when you're older and you're not able to do things. That internal monologue is yeah. the biggest, biggest issue. Like people, um, one, I could believe she was upset about it because that yeah. was you coming out of that box. Of yeah, that yeah. Was, oh, I was taking that box. Yeah, that's not what you're supposed to use. Yeah. Like, you would, I, people say a lot. That's not what a son does. That's not what a daughter does. Yeah, you're supposed to know what I Everything I did for you, you can't do it. First of all, it was me out. It was me out. Like, I wasn't prepared. I don't even have my moving shoes right now. I don't want to do this. The teamwork. The mentality, because mentality, everything that you do starts with your mentality. Absolutely. I think that's very important. And when you take away the opportunity for someone to build up to something, and it's only supposed to be, well, they need to get it done when I say it gets it done, not only are you going to get pushback, but people are now going to purposely put themselves in positions to never help you out. Mm -hmm. And when you finally need help, or when you make that call for people to help you, everyone's going to be all out of help. The, to the other point, that internal monologue is a beast because I often ask people, like, what did you think of that moment? Mm -hmm. And they'll share what they thought. And I was like, did they actually say that? Mm -hmm. Like, no. Nah. Mm -hmm. So then well, how did you get to that conclusion? I just speak louder than words. Not even just, well, that, yeah, but that's also, it was just my interpretation. Cognitive distortion. Correct, exactly. Yeah, because your interpretations are going to be rooted in your feeling, right? Like, and thoughts and emotions have a real intimate. Uh, connection. Mm -hmm. I always say that because if you're not cautious, you do what's called mood directed thinking. And so, for instance, if you're irritated, irritation, you're going to have more irritating thoughts. Now, I'm not going to do it this weekend. I'll come back in a couple weekends, get a couple of photos, you do it. Take a day. Take a day, I'll, I'll be back. I want to move now. And now, all of a sudden, I'm irritated. Why can't he just do it now? He ain't doing nothing. Irritation turns into anger. You know what? This is ridiculous. After everything I've done for him, turns into frustration. This is, he said he wasn't going to move the boxes. That turns into rage. All of those thoughts just help fuel that emotion. And it's always the internal monologue. I always tell people that you got to be mindful of it because your emotions and thoughts are like gasoline and fire. Yeah. Of course, the more powerful one is your emotions, in my professional opinion, because that's the one you have no direct control. It's none. You can't control. You can't induce an emotion. You got. You got to have effort to do it or take a chemical substance. In order to get angry, you got to relive every moment in your head, and even then, it won't be the same as in that moment. Yeah. But you have to be mindful of that eternal monologue because you. I'm pretty sure you both been in a situation. Somebody's telling you something. And I had a conversation. You was like, "Where did you get that from?" Yeah. I ain't oh, saying any of that. Well, how I was just a soul like that that's not a me thing. <laughs> you are so I never I never said I wouldn't move them at all. I said, pick a date. Yeah. I'll come back. Yeah. But I'm not here for that. Mm -hmm. I'm here to celebrate you. Mm -hmm. 
That eternal mom, that internal monologue is a beast. It is the a big contributor to a lot of issues that leave people stuck in the same place. And it was something you said earlier. That inner voice, uh, all that negative message you get, your self talk, it, it comes out of like what you would, I guess, people who do cognitive behavioral therapy would call your core beliefs. <laughs> like you only room by your core beliefs sometimes. Yeah your reactions and your reality have to be consistent with it. So even in the midst of you challenging those thoughts, I wanted to say this on camera for everybody, you can be in a place where you do not agree with a, a feeling you're having. That's why I, it, it comes across in therapy like this. I hear you, Dr. B. I just don't feel, like, I just don't believe it. That's what that is. It takes time to override that. And so I always like to encourage people that just because you catch it, and you challenge it, and it doesn't mean it's going to get fixed that day. Yeah. That thing is ingrained to fix it. If, yeah. if you actually bought into the whole notion, like, you'll quit in two weeks. I get why it's like, you know, I'm going to show you what's up. I ain't quit in two weeks. <laughs> but let's say that you did, right? Mm -hmm. The next thing you know is like, yeah, I'm probably not going to like it. Probably just going to quit. That could have turned into you quitting in everything that seemed a little out of your box or difficult. Mm -hmm. So when you catch it and you're like, no, I can do this, but deep down inside, it doesn't feel like you can. And you just gotta go forth and get the experience. Like me and you were talking about earlier, experience shapes a big part of who we are now. Yeah. Your core belief is rigid because it wants to protect protect you because it thinks that this pathway is consistent and safe. Mm -hmm. But if you catch it and you just still go forward, it starts to change. Okay, we can actually do it past two weeks. We can do it three weeks. Yeah. Oh, we'd have made it six months. Yeah. Oh, we definitely know what's up. Then all yeah. of a sudden, next thing you know, a year or two later, you're like, I used to think that I could have made it past two weeks. Now, I'm like five, ten years in now. Yeah. yeah. So I wanted to point that out because those things are, that internal monologue, it is that thing. And dress, man. It is an, yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, catching it early for me is important because I think, I don't know how, but I just think that I, I always knew like, hey, Either you're gonna stand up now or you're not gonna know how to stand up when you need to at some point in your life. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You gotta, I think that with that, either we did, me and me talked about it before, you gotta get comfortable with being uncomfortable. That phrase you said was very powerful. And uh, if you don't stand up now, you're not gonna stand up later on. I see you gotta start. I think the issue is people just starting because they're uncomfortable with what that's gonna look like. Yeah. And people don't understand that the human body, the human being as a whole, we're hedonistic. We seek pleasure at all times. We're going to take the app, the route that takes the least amount of energy. So a lot of times people don't start is because they think this next way of doing it, this new way of doing it, it's going to be super stressful. Ah, it might be this. The mites are the things that kill the dreams, the what ifs. And what if this happens? This might happen. What if that? Mm -mm. I'm going to just stick with what I know. So instead of you living out what God put on your life as your purpose, you staying at this safe job because of all the what ifs that's triggered all this stress, anxiety, and doubt to where you're now like, yeah, never mind. I'm going to just stay where I'm at. But if you get uncomfortable, if you get comfortable with being uncomfortable and accepting like failure is a possibility, but it doesn't mean it's the end, then you'll overcome a whole lot of stuff. Yeah. Like you'll overcome so many barriers if you learn how to accept a failure not as a loss but as a learning opportunity. I know it sounds cliche, but it's the God's honest truth. Like a big part of therapy is trial and error. Like if you learn that, okay, yeah, I, that's not the way to do it. So let me try it again. Yeah. All right, that way it was fifty percent right. Let me take that fifty percent and see if I can make it better. I got 60% this time. If you look at failure that way, you'll start to stand up, using the metaphor you said, for yourself more often. Yeah. You'll stop talking yourself out of better opportunities and blessings when you learn that I might fail, but it ain't the end all be all. Yeah. Because the, the thing that you're leaving from, it'll be there. Yeah. I'm so I, I hate to tell everybody this. You hate your job? It's going to be there. It's going to be there. Yeah, wait. And if you're that, so you back. If you that, exactly. If you that good and yeah. you leave it, I know they might say, well, we'll never take you back. Here, yeah, right. We'll take if you, you back. If yeah. you that good, yeah. think that, you know what? He was never a problem. He was never a problem. This is what you're doing. I can't start right <laughs> That's the new hit when you start, but it's like, yeah, he's like, yeah, he's like, hey, man, I'm on the what happened? I tried to do it. I think it's going to take me back. Of course, they're going to take me back.
Yeah. 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 And yeah. I mean, you know, I got a great example of that. Um, there was this project that I was working on for this job that was coming up. And I'll put it to the side. like, I'll get back to it whenever I get back to it. And it is nine months later. And one of my guys' mentors in the IT space, he was like, you know, you should, you should apply to this job, this job, this job. Do that, get the job. And I agreed to him. I thought what he said was correct. But then a week later, because I'm really good with like self-evaluating myself, I was like, I choose. You have all these jobs lined up. I did the research. I had 30 jobs lined up that I was going to apply to. And it's like, well, why didn't you get that other job? And I was like, oh, you didn't work on the foundational piece you were supposed to work on. So you're good with the pitching and the having a conversation. But on the technical side, you're a little bit weaker. And you're weaker because you didn't do the work. Well, what were your habits when you did the work? Well, I would work on things for two hours this day, two hours this day. And it's like, were they really two hours? Or were you multitasking? Was there like a YouTube video? Were you doing like a mental health edit in between it? Were you lighting up, you know, a whole bunch of like meetings for like mental health Monday shoots and in my shoe shoots? And I was like, oh, I wasn't focused. It was like, all right, well, if you apply to these 30 jobs and you bring that focus you didn't have before, which you didn't really finish building out your foundation before, What's going to change now if you apply to these other jobs that's a different brand of IT? And I was like, nothing. I was like, all right, so you should go back to fixing your foundation to get back to what you were doing and studying and who you were working. Let's see what they got going on. And you need to put yourself on a timer. So what I'm doing now is I study and I run a clock for how long I study, whatever I'm working on. And then I take a screenshot of all the things I was working on and I put them in folders to look back at them to see, all right, how long were you working on these things? What did you work on? What did the grades look like on those things? What were you missing? And then as you go right now, I think I'm on day three. And like right now, I got three folders that are built out, like seven screenshots here, two screenshots here. And it's like, okay, on the days you didn't study a lot, what was happening those days? And why did you study a lot? And the days you were studying the most, what was happening? And why did you study as much as you did? And then after that, how much of it are you retaining? Because I don't, Anything I work on, I don't work on things just to get a good grade or like, oh, we did an amazing job. I work on things to be like, hey, what did you retain from all the things that you worked on and how have you applied those little, all those things that you attained and what difference did it make with the people you were working with or the subject matter you were working with? Because would you say that that is a, a big key to success is um, learning how to hold yourself accountable and, and critique yourself, right? Yeah. Like a lot of times you hear you hear the opposite of, you can't love other people to you want to love yourself. That's yeah. a thousand percent true. Mm -hmm. It's difficult because then you're just, you're, you're masquerading and placating. You're doing what you think they think love is, yeah. but you really, th that phrase loving yourself is really important. You got to learn what you enjoy, how to have fun, because in the midst of loving yourself, you, you learn how to critique yourself because yeah. you're not hammering yourself or avoiding the mistakes you made. The reason why I say what you said is a key to success is because you had an honest conversation with yourself. It's kind of like, well, why didn't I get it? Where did I go wrong? Okay, I, I went wrong well here. Okay, I'm able to hold myself accountable. And then when you learn how to critique yourself, you get to put an action plan in place. Teaching people how, and I, when I say teach, I mean helping them come to terms with, you don't gotta beat yourself up because you fail at something. Yeah. You gotta, it's an honest conversation. I didn't make it because of this. It's, it's not about like they did this to me, they did that to me. That is a factor in the equation, but you're giving too many external things too much power over your own life. Where if you take time to review, did X, Y, and Z, I did get me close or yeah. further away. It's not to say that I've had, in my own personal life and with clients, yeah, there's supervisors that stopped the promotion for me, right? Cool. I'll use me as an example. I had a supervisor stop the promotion. My name is Tabitha. I don't like you, Tabitha. Um, Sit as that shit. So professional. <laughs> don't like you, Tabitha. You know, I wish you nothing but the best. <laughs> now, to this day, I still don't like you. But that was you. I wish you that quiet. <laughs> like, if I was to wish anything, like, if you get a flat tire, mm. I hope it's at 90 degree weather Ooh. and there's no shade outside mm. and the nearest help is 30 minutes away. Ooh. So that way the AC is not working <laughs> and you got no option. Yeah. That's how bad she was. Yeah. <laughs> but the but, water in the trunk, I got you. Ooh, man, matter of fact, I hope it's water in the car, but it's hot because you left it in the car. And it wasn't there. 
I said, now when you're thinking about it, you crack it open. Mm -hmm. I don't really mean that, Tabitha. I, I wish it was too late. It's out there anyway. But it's out there. Yeah. Right here. Tabitha, I, I, mm, I was trying to say I love you. I love you. I did. As a child in God. As a child in <laughs> God told me, what, if you can't love your enemy, then you ain't loving the right way. So I love that. That's when you tell someone I love who you have the ability to be. <laughs> Like I, Eddie, look, I had no ill will towards because the story I'm about to share with her it taught me an important life lesson. It really did. She blocked me from getting a promotion. And I know it was her. It wasn't just speculation. People on the panel said, sorry. You know, we did you wrong, but she had convinced the chief not to give you the promotion. And so we had just followed what his recommendation was. Um, and then the guy to gave the promotion to, I had uh, actually trained, his name was Papi, he gave me some great advice. That was the first time in my life I ever, ever like failed at something I tried. Mm -hmm. He came to me and said, look, you were wrong. Money of all the lot. She did it, that's in the past. But what you do going forward is gonna determine what happens next. They're gonna watch it, mm -hmm. see how you handled this. Not act of, shrug it off, Keep moving. I probably should have worked out in your favor, but whatever you do, don't rebel. I did the opposite. Oh my gosh. I I grew up, you can't, you can't have a beard on this job. I grew out of beard. <laughs> yeah. Literally, that's right. everything that she said, which mm -hmm. wasn't true, yeah. she now had a foundation to stay on. And when they moved me to Midnight's, yeah. she was the one that told me. And I saw the smirk on her face too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like she was ready to tell me we said in you to midnight. And I say that to say this is why I appreciate that less of her to the point of the story is this is that I gave her the fuel she needed. Mm -hmm. Even though it wasn't she lied or it made these things up. I gave her the fuel she needed and then I dumped down on giving her the fuel because then I acted up after that. I wasn't in a space where I could take a step back and and give myself the power in my actions in it. I never belittle that outside factors play a role in where you are in your life. We were just talking about that earth, how brain development happens. But I learned in therapy that people give too much power away. And in that moment, I didn't give myself back that power like you did by having that conversation with myself like, yeah, I got robbed. Okay, it's been confirmed. Yeah. But, but, okay, what did I do? To contribute to this and it was an honest moment because um one of her big complaints was well if you put him in a position with leadership in this higher level leadership he has a tendency of speaking his mind he's very blunt i was so i was like okay if she was able to say that to them and they believed it then that means i need to change my approach you know he can be very uh antagonistic when you, you don't know i'm sorry when i perceive disrespect that is true that is a real <laughs> thing about me. I used to struggle with it. If you disrespect me, it's a problem. Yeah. Like you can have a difference of opinion, that's fine. Yeah. But disrespect is a whole different thing. Those were honest moments that after I got sick to midnight, because clearly on midnight you got nothing but time to think. Yeah. I was like, I put myself here. Yeah. yeah. I could she didn't do anything. If I didn't give her the fuel mm -hmm. And just would have listened to Papillon in that moment, I wouldn't be here. But it was the best thing, that one of the best things that ever happened to me in my life. Because then I learned, this is before I became a therapist. In that moment, I learned like, okay, I got to learn to sit with myself and evaluate myself. Because I wouldn't have given it up there yeah. if I didn't give her the fuel. Because all she did was speculate and say things. All right, cool. But y'all believed her. That means that Jay's a part of you that believes that I'm okay with you. He says, let me show you different. No, what I do? Yeah. Rebel. I mean, hard. I was showing up late. Yeah. Grew out my beard. Yeah. He didn't try to talk to me. I'm like, whatever. It don't matter. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, that was a, a very important life lesson. I think that what you said right there is a key to growth. Being able to be comfortable with critiquing yourself. Yeah. Don't give everything outside of you so much power in your life. Yeah. Start taking some of that back. When I start to feel like that, because I have the same qualities, I just bleh, really? leave. Yeah. yeah. Then like I leave on a good note. So it's like, oh, you oh, never know. That's like, a good leave. Then. Yeah. I don't get to the point where I'm actually acting. When I start to feel myself like, oh, that's it. Yo, then I'm like, oh, okay, I have to go. Yeah. <laughs> that's a black thing for real. Like, at that job, it was a couple of, to your point in that part, it was a couple of times I because I was fresh out of the military when I had this job and they had their own little culture mm -hmm. of disrespect. Mm -hmm. So I used to be like, 
Yeah. Like seriously, I used to. Yeah. I, I remember thinking of times where I had to pull somebody one on one. Yeah, I just and had one up there. I, I yeah. was like, right there. <laughs> I, 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 I had to be like, you could talk to them like that. Don't you? I, I don't. I don't care about this child. Yeah. I, I, don't I don't care. care. That's about this child. Because I would lose it if you disrespect me like yeah. that. Yeah. I feel you on that. That was a better way of doing it. I'm going to quit. Because this place is getting me out of care. Yeah. But I agree with it because that comes from a place, right? It really does. It's kind of like, what is your coping mechanism? Yeah. Sometimes if it's working for you, I would say keep doing it. I would say mine, being honestly, it was working up until that point. It had worked. It had worked perfectly up until that point because as human beings, we're habitual with our behavior. Mm-hmm. We'll keep. You ever see somebody keep treating you a certain way? And they're like, why don't you ever listen? I don't like how you're treated. Right. They're doing it because they. It's a habit, and they haven't thought of another way. Mm-hmm. Like, we don't waste behavior up until a point. Yeah. Then that was a point where I realized that my old way of living, for where I grew up, it didn't transfer into this environment. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think. Uh, for me, I'm a very powerful person. Right now, what you guys saw in terms of me being that the deal was, man, that boy went through a lot. But in order to build myself up, also I had to build a lot of pride that coincided with building myself as a person. So like in college football, I think the best 40 time I ever ran as a D lineman, I was at 294 and I ran a 482. So I'm bad for 294. 294 pounds? Yeah, 294 yeah, pounds. Uh, and my game speed is actually different from the 40 speed. I never realized, like, hey, you have a very different game speed from your 40 speed. Faster? Faster. Those Much speed. faster. So, like, there were, like, highlights. My my coaches got rid of my film when I went to go to Childs, and I didn't realize I was out of the school that gets rid of your film three years later, which is crazy. We discovered that. Mm-hmm. But there were, like, highlights of me running past, like, cornerbacks and corners in order to tackle wide receivers 15 to 20 yards up the field my junior year. Right, the next year, the numbers weren't as good. I also got hurt, I like had a torn meniscus and I broke my fifth metatorsal my senior year, right? But I always think back like, hey man. Me and for, for the people that don't know. He heard himself, but I remember the numbers being different. And this time around, when it came to the job, the same pride thing happened. I was proud that I accomplished being an architect, knowing the knowledge, doing what I need to do to not only fit in, but understand everything that was being said. But there's a different part of your side that you have to be able to apply the technical side, literally. You have to know how to whip up a virtual machine and secure it correctly. Like, what is your mode of operation? What's your security process? If you're working for a company, when you're doing interviews, what information can be shared publicly with people with which you can't share publicly with people and i was like oh no you're not you're not working on it now you become this thing you forgot you have to keep practicing being the thing oh people and that's the most important part so like as i do all the work that i do now like i have a lot of conversations with my partner being very realistic and she'll question like why well, are you doing this are you doing this and i told her well no i can't do that because if i do that it'll take away from this like I'm even very sensitive about saying yes and no to things. Like, I called my guy up who's a part of the program that we're a part of. He had a couple of jobs lined up with Panasonic and a couple other big companies, right? And he said no to them to work on a bigger project that I'm looking into right now. But like I told him, hey, I'm glad that you are where you are and you have the confidence to be who you need to be now. But like, He's like, you should just do interviews. I said, no, I'm aware of what I haven't been doing. So even if I just go in to do interviews and get the jobs that you guys think I'm qualified for now, being out of practice means you need to get back to the basics and be very serious about those basics. And you need to do, you need to make getting back to the basics as fun as possible because you're the only one that's going to be in the journey as you figure things out. So like, I used to have an anxiety with, if you're timing yourself, you get feel the anxiety. I'm running out of time, I'm running out of time. Now, when I time myself, I look forward to, well, how much time did we use? How did we use the time? Like, 
Did you enjoy the questions? Like when you read the questions, do you feel yourself getting tight or did you feel yourself getting excited at the possibility of eating be either being right or wrong and how did that make you feel? And I realized, oh, that's how I've made my learning process better for who I used to be when I was younger. Yeah, I would how you approach them is the lens you approach them is gonna determine how far you can go with it. Yeah. Because going back to seeing like being comfortable with being uncomfortable. Like for you mild to the medium, mild to moderate stress helps growth in a learning, right? Yeah. Your brain grows from stress. I know cortisol is considered a bad hormone. It is when it's flooded your system a little bit too much. And too long. And too long. That that thank you so much. That's the better way. Doctor when it's started like doctor pediatrician doctor is when it's too long. Not too too uh, it could be too much. Mm. But when it's in there too long, because chronic states of stress throws off our fight or flight system. So I don't want to just keep saying the word ought or not. It throws off your fight or flight system, making the part of the brain that activates that sis, uh, system very sensitive, right? So when it comes to stress though, we do a lot of our best learning under stress sometimes. Stress isn't always a bad thing. It just doesn't need to be chronic and really, really long. So when you become comfortable with being uncomfortable, you become comfortable with the unknown and a healthy level of stress. In order for you to get physically fit to become a better athlete, you gotta put your body in the stress. There's no way around. Stay in hoodies, stay in long pants, stay yep. in heat. Always uncomfortable. The purpose of training both in military and athletics, repetition. The reason why we have you do repetition as far as movements and drills is because it becomes instinctual. Because what happens is, <laughs> I said I wouldn't use no L. No, no, go ahead. Use the, so, use the word and explain it. There are three things that occur in your brain that makes new behavior and makes it a habit. Uh, myelination that establishes a new behavior. Uh, long-term, what is it? Long-term potentiation. So what it is is that once you establish a behavior and you do it enough times, Athletes are able to better recognize or come or understand this. When you start a new movement, like a foot pattern movement, if you're playing football or a new combination in boxing, it feels awkward as, at first. But as you focus on it and do it more, it becomes more natural. That's that second term. Long -term muscle memory. Muscle memory and long-term potentiation, is, that's the second part of it. And then you have some myelination, long-term potentiation, and adoration, I believe it's called. What it is is that once you get that movement down or that new way of learning, it's now encoded in your brain and it grows to other areas. Meaning that that's when, for sports, you start to look at the game a lot differently. Like you got your movement down, your sequence, and then you start looking at the defender's movement in conjunction to your sequence. You start realizing that when you watch a game, or when you watch something you're passionate about, you take that one thing you're really good at and now you're looking at everything around it. That's a big part of um, learning when it comes to stress and developing a new behavior. A lot of times, like we were saying, you'll talk yourself out of it because you're worried about the stress. Half the time, it's not even that bad. Think about it, when you did your temperature check with yourself, was it really that bad to implement the new plan? Like set your timer and then go to be comfortable with I laugh. It's, I laughed because I was just like, <clears throat> it's very, and I, I learned, I have a great work ethic from my mom, but not all work ethic is structured. Mm -hmm. So she's very much like, hey, you get up, you get it done, you get to, we get it done as much as possible, we figure out the plan as we go. And I'm very much, all right, if I know the plan, I can figure out how to do it more efficiently. I could create steps towards it. I could also figure out who do I need to be during this plan to get it done as efficiently as possible and to create a space where I am the least irritated version of myself as we're accomplishing what I need to accomplish. Oh, they do. Yeah. So I always tell people, just do it, take small steps mm -hmm. when doing something different to be the best version of yourself. Yeah. Like if you're doing something now, mm -hmm. just come up with what, it don't gotta be like a grand plan. It could be, what can I do? If I was given 10 minutes to start, what can I do at 10 minutes? And then what can I do with the next 10 minutes? It's yeah. small incremental changes to gain momentum. That's why I like, 
that whole part about being comfortable with being comfortable. You don't grow to break out of your own box and can you put yourself in. Yeah. Because you know, it's, it's, I get it, it's, it's, it's anxious, like, uh, but I can't. I know this box. I'm comfortable in this box. Yeah. But the moment that you go, okay, well, let me try a little bit of something different. You learn me will come about, but it's going to be stressful. Yeah. Can I offer a different perspective? Go right short. So, so, through my childhood and adolescence, I was conditioned to suck it up. Mm. And so, literally, comfortable with being uncomfortable to the point where I just, I'm avoiding confrontation. I'm also not often mm -hmm. not. And so, it wasn't until I got so uncomfortable that it was like, something's got to change. That's when I stood up for myself. So that's in like age 31. Yeah. Um, and so I just want to caution people against like, make like making it so that your boundaries are invisible or like having non-existent boundaries. You know what I mean? Like we don't want people to think like, oh yeah, I just want to be uncomfortable. Yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate the clarity. Yeah, no, no, no. Cool, cool. And the other thing is like, I am so not confrontational that I don't, I look so internally, like I internalize so much that I always assume that I am the problem. Like if it didn't work out, it was always me, which until I was in my like mid twenties, I didn't even factor racism or like, you know, those biases into the reasons yeah. why things were going in the way that they were going and stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of it. I'm proud of from talking out loud. No, I do that. So every time you talk out loud, I'd be like, no, I said that shit. <laughs> you know, and I appreciate the context because you're you aware. Well, I hope nobody got that from this because you should never get comfortable with somebody. I'm mean, using the word disrespect. Disrespecting you or blaming you for something you shouldn't do. No, 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 no. Yeah. This, uh, turn the other cheek is one part of the Bible. I, I always <laughs> struggle with that for the longest because that wouldn't get. I, I don't yeah. serve a God that tells me get beat. Like, yeah. She lost it's your mind. Not, 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 not at all. That passage is about forgiveness. But to yeah. that point, no, you should. When I say get comfortable with being uncomfortable, I mean implementing new behaviors. Mm -hmm. Like, for instance, those invisible boundaries yeah. you're talking about. If you struggle with setting those boundaries, mm -hmm. get comfortable with setting, setting. Boundaries. Yeah, That's why I'm glad you gave the context because. You should never have invisible boundaries in my professional opinion. You should have concrete boundaries or concrete negotiated boundaries depending on who you have in your life. Like uh, a lot of times therapists will teach clients set the boundary, but then they don't tell them, depends on how you set it with whom you're setting it with because you can't just set like a hard boundary with your wife about something where y'all been doing it for so long. You gotta negotiate that a little yeah. bit. Now keep in mind, it's context to it. Yeah. And if they're hurting you, berating you, right. they need to set that boundary. Yeah. But if it's something, I can't think of one right now, but it's always like, you know that's not my attention. You know what I'm not trying to hurt you. Let's well, see that. Cause you don't want her to fall into that. You know, we can go with that. No, no, we can go with that. We can go with that. Like for instance, like uh, you, she sets a boundary with you as far as you need to put the toilet seat down. I'm sick of this. Every time I go on, I fall. Baby, my bad. You know what I mean? I get tired of yeah. the wall and I wake up. Wet booty in the middle. <laughs> I wake yeah. up, you know, yeah. I'm mm. toilet water just. Mm. You know I'm a yeah. trouble yeah. where I go. I come home, I'm tired. I might not put it back down. Mm. My bad, well, you need to do it because otherwise, yeah. if you don't do it, we won't have sex or I won't talk to you. Yeah. You got to negotiate or I'll never be happy. Or I'll yeah. never be happy. You yeah. got to negotiate that because you got to get grace because. They gotta. They now have to accommodate, implement that in the boundary. Mm -hmm. And so you should. I'm glad you said that, Doctor. Joe. You should never. Don't ever set an invisible boundary. Yeah. Set it and talk to the person. If they call, the random person on the street, don't touch me. You know, right. I don't, yeah. don't touch me. Yeah. Don't ever touch me. Mm -hmm. All right. I need you and everybody in the earshot to know. Mm -hmm. Don't touch me. Yeah. yeah. But if it's like that, not that one, but if you're talking to somebody like, look, this is what I mean. Mm -hmm. This is what you do. Can you do it or can we weave in the middle? Mm -hmm. uh, don't let me yeah. set the boundary because you're reacting for a reason. Yeah. yeah. You're, I always say this, your brain cares about your survival. Your mind cares about your mental health. If you're having a reaction, your brain might not have all the information, mm -hmm. but it's letting you know it's uncomfortable. I always tell people this in therapy honor that emotion yeah. meaning air it out and talk to it. why why are we uncomfortable with this what's yeah. going on yeah i need to pay look xyz i didn't mean that that's not what that meant it actually means a b c okay cool now your body is like okay we, we got the information yeah. Yeah. you don't ever get comfortable with someone mistreat yeah. 
idea. Not at all. And, no. and, and then I'll add one other thing before we wrap this up. Your two steps are just as important as that one mile that you ran. Oh, yeah, definitely. So, like, the day before yesterday, I did, like, four and a half hours worth of studying. It's straight through, right? I think it was, like, an eight-hour period. I remember working. A couple of people interrupted me. But when I got back to it, hit stop, hit start, hit stop, hit start. That's actually the artist's habit. Make sure to hit stop and hit start as I'm doing it, right? And then yesterday, I only got, like, an hour and a half, an hour and 45 minutes. But I was like, I had an hour and 45 minutes. I had an important call with a friend. And then they get a job with Panasonic, but they put it down. But they're working on something important, a project we're going to work on. They sent me some clips of what's the next thing we're going to work on, which is going to be like the implementation on that's going to be crazy. So I have an opportunity to learn a lot from them. I didn't do what I did yesterday, but man, today was a great day for that hour and 45 minutes. Put it in the log and I was like, hey, just acknowledge that's a great day. It's a great day. day right there. You did good. So your two steps are always as important as your one mop. And I'd like to show all in your success. Mm -hmm. and I wish more people did that. I, I'm a big fan of checklists. And yeah, you got something to do, put it on the checklist. I always tell people, and then put an X right or a check right beside. Mm -hmm. That way you can see where you, how far you've come. Yeah. Because like I said earlier, we have a negative bias. We hyper-focus on the broad information. But when you put your goals on paper, once to see you are significantly more likely to do them. But also you gain momentum. You gain that dopamine. All right, I did that. Okay, I did that. Man, I'm halfway through the list already. Yeah. And, and knock out one. But I'm glad that you're loving your success. Because I figured up that positive feedback loop yeah. from how far you, like That's, you said, that two feeling. miles is just as the yeah. oldness that one. It's a new feeling, man. Because, like, my pushback on my parents and how they taught me was to always avoid doing a list. So I had to, like, change my feelings towards that kind of thinking. Because, like, everyone needs a list, whether you yeah, or not. Because so you don't know, you, you take for granted, <clears throat> you take for granted all the positive moments and all the success you had because you're just focused on where things went wrong. Yeah. That lit, I, I tell everybody, we live in an age of iPhones, Androids that can use them, uh, technology. Like, you should be, they got task list apps. You should be putting stuff on there, checking them off. And then I tell everybody, every two weeks, every three weeks, go back and look at everything you did. Yeah. You know, what's, and, what's important though? Sometimes just typing out the date. Oh, yeah. Like the date itself. Like, I, that's what you did today. This represents something. That means today, no matter what you did, there was time spent on your goal right here. Exactly. Yeah. And then when you look at what you did, it's like, dang, I watched all that or dang, I listened to all that. I could give you actually a good receipt for each one that I watched and reviewed. Oh, I didn't know that one thing. I didn't understand anything from that. But like two months later, oh, no, I know what that is like the back of my head. Yeah. And it's like, you know, that's that's what progress is. That's so yeah. I like that because and I'll like to get along with it. That's why I going back to those three You're things. You're not long winded, man. You wanna write real fast. No, those three things I said earlier about creating no behavior with the myelination, uh, long term potentiation and uh I think it's arbitrary. The A word is eluding me right now, but it, it increases the dendrites in your brain, but all of that I think it is that word. It's just a looted. The people are going to tell us. Yeah. <laughs> it was all the trash. That's what it was. <laughs> it's not it's a, what it means right now. Because if it works when I get in the car, it's going to be like, that's what it is. You're going to text it to me. It is. But in, in the steps of what you're saying right now with mm -hmm. your list, that's ultimately what the reason why I use the brain parts of it is the, the selling point or the key point is whether you do it sloppy or you do it ugly, as long as you're consistently doing it, yeah. it becomes smooth and then it becomes a new habit. That's why I like that you're doing a list because it, it, it don't need it. People think that change has to be a huge drastic thing. It's, it's not. Yeah. If you just get the habit now, and let's say how you were talking about eating healthy as a child. Let's say that as a parent, your child is overweight and you want them to be healthy, but you, you don't know how. I'm being so serious. If you just practice giving your child fruit, mm -hmm. just one piece of food a day, that's all you got. I'm so serious, everybody. Like a little thing of grapes. Just toss here, it to them. here, here's some yeah. grapes. I want to see you eat them real quick. I don't like. Yeah. Just do it. You not only give him a habit, you're giving yourself a habit. Yeah. After a while, that part of the brain that corrects the recipes, the, yeah. the, the the accountability part, mm -hmm. it'll go. I can give my child grapes today. Yeah. It really will kick in. Hey, eat these grapes. <laughs> Why am I eating grapes? I say eat the grapes, please. It's the, but having this banana, eating this apple, it's those, it's just the small things. Then after a while, the kid will probably like, he'll come to you and be like, 
Yeah, I got my brakes. I ain't got no brakes with that. Because yeah. after a while, their body and their brains are looking, yours are kicking. The next thing you know, that third part, the one I'm forgetting, yeah. it grows that habit. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. That's why I said when you look at the film, you yeah. start looking at it differently. Mm -hmm. And real, real world applications outside of that, it grows that habit even more. Mm -hmm. Now, instead of giving them one serving of food a day, you're doing two. Before you know it, three months down the road, they don't even eat like Dorito or Taki. Yeah. Or Taki. Taki's out of devil. They are, oh, they are, they are why so they good for so many people who are me. I don't eat Takis. <laughs> My other folks do. I don't eat Taki. <laughs> or, or you can step your game up. You start associating like their favorite thing with the fruit too. Yeah. Like, oh, you want to read a book harder? Hey, hey, it's like, oh, I got your book. It's great. It's like, oh, man, appreciate you. Yeah. You read it. Yeah. At that point, because that, that's, it's literally small steps. I cannot stress that enough. If you take small steps and make it a new habit, I know. Yeah. It's, 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 it's all, it's all about. One line in the movie Crushes is, she says, I think at the very end, like her teacher told her, the longest journey starts with the, with the single step. It yeah. sure does. So. And it, it, it usually is that bad one first step. Yeah. Because then I've, I've seen so many people do something afterwards after they talk about it. I'm like, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was. See, that monster you built up in my head, yeah. there's a way worse than a reality. They're always like, no, Dr. Eager wasn't that bad. Yeah. Yeah, I, I believe me. Uh, you're right. So when you and your brother gonna bring this on for our, our you know, episode so we could come up and rap it. Yo, that's a good idea. We actually, our, our producer said, when we go over Corey again, I gotta meet with him. He <laughs> <laughs> said that, I was like, oh yeah, we do that. <laughs> The scheduling thing, I, mean, I tell you, the scheduling thing, if you, if you He's don't want to like, get on camera, well, not on camera, get on a phone call and we yeah. joke around about who you should schedule and start reaching out to them, let me know. Cause yeah, like the process of scheduling people is actually one of the hardest parts of what we do. Matter of fact, y'all could, could be on our first episode. That, that the same thing right there. Cause I, what I don't like that shoot. I need to change that this year. We know when we shoot on Fridays, but I've been training on Friday. You know, I'm like, I got to change that. Um, but I will let y'all know because y'all got to meet with Keith tomorrow mm -hmm. and discuss that. Y'all could do the very first episode. Yeah. I tried to bring on different voices. Mm -hmm. Then, um, then my, to be honest with y'all, I want to I want to bring on somebody. I'm so glad y'all appeared together because this is confirmation for me. I want to bring on somebody that doesn't do mental mental health. That's a female mm -hmm. to ask us questions because we get in our head about it. We like yeah. We and you talked about to where I was like, the juice, I struggle with content because like, I don't know what to talk about. No. He asked me a question. He was like, that's like seven episodes right there with that. And I was like, hey, I don't see that. Yeah, we yeah. just got to talk. You mean when I pull up after we do the shoot, we're just going to have a whiteboard. And every time I say like, hey, that's an episode, I want someone to just write it on the board. Because yeah. like yeah. the topics don't matter. It's the willingness to talk about the topic itself. Yeah. Like in our talk, we had like, we weren't supposed to talk about this today. The suicide prevention piece, and yeah, and you know, how our week's gone, the event. I, I was good, actually. We talked about what you did, man, because I was like, this goal. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? But everything else we talked about for this last hour, that was a schedule. We're supposed to talk about the business that of the um private oh, we? that you yeah it's all it's all in the goal we're supposed to talk about the My business bad. and what's it like running that business tell me more about the business side and how important it is the paperwork a lot of people don't realize how much paperwork you got going on man what yeah yeah oh the relationships you got to protect and sometimes oh, the as a that. therapist being a professor, we're supposed to talk about that yeah, importance that, of being a professor. That's, so that's what you said. Yeah. When are we going to start? I said, all right, we just started yeah. going back to teaching. Yeah. I got to figure it out. But that this, I tell mm -hmm. all my clinicians, like, the therapy part's easy. But yeah. When you do it so much, it's like, yeah, that's it. I, I see the problem. I'm walking through it. Everything else. That business part, mm -hmm. oh, my. That's a whole discussion. Ooh, that's the next that's yeah. the next episode. Yeah, next time we meet up. Yeah. Hey, that's why I was like, hey, I, I gave it. But the business part, part. You're right. We should talk. Because yeah. the business part, in my opinion, is why you a lot of people can't find a therapist. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because it's the like it's you either work for an agency without paying you enough, mm -hmm. or you do it yourself and you realize there's a big demand, low yeah. supply. And then when you try to branch out and have clinicians under you, you realize, whoa, no one prepared me for this. There's a whole like I'll give an example. I'll give y'all this quick example. When we bring on a new clinician, we gotta get them handled. Right. We got with the insurance. With the insurance company, because we take my panel. My panel. I got uh, so when, so one thing we run into is that this is what happens. You might get a new clinician, and now you gotta get them paneled with the insurance company to accept your uh, insurance. 
So then what happens is they can start seeing people because they're licensed in their state, but we can't build the insurance company just yet because they're not paneled. Paneling takes forever. So here's the, here's the tricky part. We just added an expense via the clinician that doesn't generate any revenue. So you know the first place that comes out of because they got to get paid. We signed a contract to play them. That comes out of the owner's compensations. And meaning that what we pay ourselves, we got to take some of that off to pay them. So that now you got to factor in, man, we want to bring in new clinicians because we got a big demand. Ah, we got to make sure we generate enough revenue to cover that rough period of three to six months before they get paneled. So that's, these are all business factors that come into play that I think that most people don't realize, like, why you can't find a lot of therapists in certain areas, right? The most only incentive to not bring people on to work with you. But wait, hold on. Does it cost money to panel, get somebody panel? It can, not really, no. You don't have, have to pay the insurance company? No. no, no in medicine, sure. you are in an onboarding period where you can't start working until you are onboarded. Yeah, no. You guys can't do that? No, no, yeah, we do. We, to my knowledge, no, we have somebody else that handles the paneling for us. Ooh. Right, but- We outsource it. The, so they, the person cannot start working until all the boxes are checked, like until you have- No, not for us, no, no. not for us. We just can't build your insurance yet. Yeah. So for us, as a licensed clinician, yeah. You can do therapy. So they can come in the first of right. therapy. We'll take their insurance information, but we can't bill them until that person, till this clinician is paneled with that right. insurance company. So we're, you're basically doing free therapy, but then we can back bill up to a year. Oh, okay. So that's how that works. So like we have one whole year to back. Bill. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's I'm how to save you money, maybe have them on. Oh, yeah. And then we thought that to no. your point, we, thought that, like, we have a whole year before we could back down uh, your insurance company. So we just come in here, we'll talk to you. Yeah, go ahead, they do the thing, and we back build up for you. Okay. But yeah, that's that to that point, it's a struggle with bringing people in because of that. You got to make sure that you're generating enough revenue, and, like having a slush fund or an account set aside for a new clinician coming in. And even just like the whole process of becoming a therapist, everybody talks about. We should talk about <laughs> Everybody's like, mental health is a big deal. The process to get licensed as a clinician is domotating for no reason. It's it is, horrible. It is a whole, yeah. it is a really bad, I don't know if they just don't have enough people reviewing all this stuff, but it, it's a long, it's not like, 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 like that on purpose. Mm. It's always structured on purpose. Even down to the way you describe how your company has to be ran, it's incentivized on purpose to make sure you guys do certain things or don't want to do certain things. Mm -hmm. I agree. It, it feels like it puts a lot of sacrifice on the person who owns it. Man, what? A lot. Yes. Is it expensive? It's expensive for you guys. Like my each license I have costs like a thousand dollars. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. You got a if you license in DC, Maryland, or Virginia, they all got different fees. Yeah. Then you got to get different continued education yeah. for all those jurisdictions. Yeah. Then you got to ready yeah. up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah it's, it, it, it's lucrative. Don't get me wrong. It's a lifestyle that I would, I wouldn't trade it in because I've gotten used to it. Yeah. And it's, but it's forced me to think outside of the box to expand mental health. Like how do you provide mental health? That's why I like one of the big things that I don't mind doing is Psychoeducation, as far as going out and speaking to people, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and believe it or not, if you're a church, I'll do it for free. I don't know why. I just can't, because it just feels weird charging churches to me. They'll do a love offer. They, they trick me. They'd be like, we're going to take a love offer. And I'd be like, y'all can just keep it. And usually mm -hmm. I just give it back as a tie. Yeah. Let's tie the back of the church. <clears throat> but it's, it's forcing me to try, kind of be more creative on how to generate revenue for the practice. Because this big green machine called capitalism. It's got a really strong foot. Oh, it's going to yeah. win in one way or another. Yeah. So you got to just think outside of the box to generate additional revenues. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about Nana? Nana could work, could work with the That's what it mm -hmm. the Mending Wounds. Mending Wounds Co. Yeah, that's yeah. still coming soon. Okay. All right, let me know what that's like. <laughs> my, I might put it in the Google Doc and be like, go ahead and watch that and tell me what you think. And you know, when you guys will want to work with her. Yeah. An amazing individual. She, she, she keeps for her super And she's very it's young. Like, yeah. Oh, they do. She, uh, <coughs> she studied public health, but she's created these um, workshops for women struggling with trauma to heal from trauma on their own because the American Health Center system oh, 
you know, leads people Bill like Bill X. Bill X. Um, yeah. yeah, so she's actually struggled with PTSD herself. She's been having suicidal ideation. She went to a psychiatric mm-hmm. unit. And so she figured out on her own how to like recover from all that stuff and thrive. So that's what's true. I think that is beautiful. And I would love to be real because a lot of times I tell people this is that we go to school to be therapists, not business people. And the reason, one other reason, we'll talk about this on the next time we'll come back and talk about it. Another reason why you have a hard of seats. You say, what? They have a bunch of seats. I know, right? The another reason why it's hard to find therapists is it's not always lucrative, especially in this area here. Amen. So a lot of, well, I can at least speak for a lot of male therapists <clears> today. <throat> Once they get licensed and they become a doctor, they pivot right to teaching mm-hmm. full time. Full time faculty because it's consistent revenue with this higher revenue. Yeah. Like the only reason me and my own brother do as well as we do is because we own our own practice. Yeah. So like to that point, the reason why I said that would be a good thing because the concept of a workshop if you talk to another clinician about it, they'd be like, she could literally book like, yeah, dude, set up a workshop here. We just charge a simple fee of yeah. 20 bucks to come. Yeah. Give it, they'll be like, mm, I don't know. Cause they, they don't believe in their ability to do it. Cause they're not taught business in right. school. Yeah. I would definitely let it work. This is your door, of course. So yeah. man, I'm not it's the best this up there. The the business, business course. course, like, and just like when they figure that out and make it content for the YouTube. But I would yeah. love to work with her, work, pick her brain, be yeah. part of the because I've been, that's the, that's the other thing. Workshops are a real easy way to get therapy into the community. Mm-hmm. It's not just about getting them to come to the office. Yeah. Like, I'm a firm believer, you got, that's why I like panels and stuff like that. And I like to get up to the community, into the community, because you might not come to the office or log in virtually, because you've never heard of me. Right. Yeah. Well, you've never seen nobody that looks like you that does therapy. Mm-hmm. And I'm, in the community yeah. with you. Yeah. I'm right here. Here's a car. Yeah. I'm running out of cars all the time. <laughs> it's a shame that the people that need therapy the most are unable to afford it. Crazy. You know? Crazy. And the crazy thing is, yeah, but it, the accepting the shares as a clinician is, is tricky. You guys might see online. You can cut this off. I don't even keep rambling with it, but the reason why- I love the gyms, man. I love you. The reason why, like, you see a lot of clinicians take a lot of, they don't take insurance. Whereas insurance companies pay you peanuts on the dollar right. as a clinician. So, like, you need it. Because you, you legally can't talk about it. But some insurance companies will pay you as low as $85 an hour for a client. Look, you, you ain't gonna be able to live in, in D.C. Wait, like, or buy those licenses that you yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I'm so serious. That's why I use, look, you look online, a lot of clinicians are like, I take $200 per session or $150 per session, but I'll super bill your insurance so you get a little bit back. It's not greed, it's $85 an hour. I promise you, it sounds like a lot, but in therapy world, 20, I personally, Dr. Brian thinks that if you see it more than 25 clients, you're at burnout. Mm-hmm. You're at burnout because for one whole hour because people are asked why it's stupid they go but you make 85 hours an hour that's a lot of money hey, but for one whole hour i'm fully in tune and engage everything you're saying i've never had a job so i became a therapist with for a whole hour i'm fully engaged in everything when i come out of that i gotta decompress real yeah. quick and then go right back into the next one you're not about to stack your schedule with eight clients a day to be able to make a lot of money. No, yeah. five clients a day is enough because you still got to put in notes. Yeah. And if you run it yourself, you still got to write reports. You still got to track your finance. You still got to do marketing or do what I do, meet good people or how pay people to do my art. Like it's, it's a lot. That's why you don't see a lot of clinicians accepting insurance, but the, the people who need it most, or they really have, if you're lucky, is insurance and Medicaid like that. I was just yeah. on the same <laughs> thing. We didn't even we talk, talk about Medicaid sitting there. DC's Medicaid requirement, I get why they have it and I'm not knocking it. It's, it's, it's a lot. Maryland Medicaid requirements are a whole lot easy. DC wanted to say, and they got a moratorium, so they're not even taking new applications yeah. to apply to accept Medicaid because we put in an application and we're trying to take a uh, these are Medicaid. Uh, we got a moratorium. We're not taking new ones right now. Don't know when it's going to be up or over with. So yeah, yeah we didn't even talk about it. Yeah. Medicaid. This last 20 minutes is easy a three hour episode. Yeah. I believe that's, that's how easy it is. That's why I was like, we just, uh, I think you and I need to just start talking 
once a week on like a Thursday or Wednesday for like 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I'll be like, all right, just talk. We're going to chat about things. And I'm like, all right, I need to see an episode on this, 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 and this. Bill me later. But that, but Keith is, that whole billing thing, Keith is, oh, he, he's a better person to talk about that. Because he, he'll call, oh, no, he'll no, call no, the no, insurance. No. He'll be like, oh, hey, we, what is this? He'll call me and be, because I can't say their names. Yeah, they, they have, they have yeah. been times. Yeah. Where and I don't know why it it, it, it bothers my spirit. I didn't talk about how much you move. Cause <laughs> we'll I'll I'll track. I handle the business side of everything. Yeah. Like me and you've talked about. My younger brother hates business. Mm -hmm. So she she was that. Oh, okay, all right, cool. Yeah. cool. Yeah. So like I'll track the money. I allocate where it needs to go. I take care of marketing and everything else. And I look out with like some was off. Our numbers right now. Like our revenue numbers are off. He'll, he's on, he'll call the insurance company and be like, yeah, such and such company said that we voided your checks for the last two weeks because we overpaid you the previous week. And we're like, okay, how do we track when you're, because it's clearly a, a rhythm or a pattern to this. How do we track so we can account for, oh, we don't know. We just know after the fact. So then we just void the checks that you won't get paid two weeks later. It's like, yeah. like he'll call and he'll see it. He'll see the code and be like, oh, they're about to void the next set of checks. Oh, seriously. Like, they'll, the insurance company thing is That's he's great. really passionate about it he don't go in depth because it was blowing his mind because every time we have to meet i'm like something's off on them they gotta be our first four person sit down what's four of us to have sit down I mean, that's from the therapy side, but from the medical side, it's also crazy. It's like, you know, you've been stabilized on a medication for no condition you have for years, and then they change the formulary in January and like, oh, they found something else. Like, what? Crazy. <laughs> Hold on. What? Yes, I mean, it is. Yes, it is. I was just saying it. I was just saying it. Hold on. 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 I, I mean this for the lay person, not just clinicians, and mm -hmm. is that Dr. Bean, Dr. Keith, pretty sure even Dr. Jones, you've heard this. All right, why are there not many black therapists or black doctors out there? Like, why are they all hard to find? One, just getting to that position, like what you said, like when you said earlier, like, have a do a recent, I felt you. Yeah. I've always been one male in a room full of traditionally white women mm -hmm. going through mental health. That's like, yeah, the micro, your little microaggression, you deal with that. Just being black and a predominantly white unit in the military, so it's hard to just get in certain spaces. And then when you get there, no one's really walking you through the process right. of doing it on your own. Yeah. So you're under somebody else. Mm -hmm. And then they either are promoting you just for their own end, end goals, but they're not promoting you. Like there's a lot of stuff on the business side yeah. that affects why we don't see too many of us because it's like, I, I never judge a clinician when they go, and they said it at that get together that we was all at, but they go, I need to take a break. Okay. I know, but I get it. I get it. It's, it's a lot. When you do it on your own, it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot. It's a whole lot. And then when you try to grow it to get more people to work with you to do it, it's the new world. Yeah. That's why a lot of black people will. Any minority group that I'm with you, white people kind of got it, got it down. They got their a system in place that's been yeah. white supremacists. But yeah, they, they got a system in place that benefits them. But if you're outside of that group and yeah. you're trying to do it on your own, it's, it's difficult. That's why me and Keith, we always love helping clinicians. We always try to motivate them to tell them it's not hard on your own. It's a lot of work. It is, I always tell them there's a difference. It's not as hard as you think. But it's a whole lot of work and yeah. repetitive work and that yeah you're going to get to know the insurance companies right away well. you're going to have one panel person you know you're going to see things and be like oh my goodness we got a plan for this we got to wait for this it's a lot of work but it's not hard yeah. they just don't know that and it's very important to realize and recognize people that are really trying to ally with you that aren't from your immediate community and you like folks that really want to see you be great simply because you're already doing the work like for her, that's definitely my story. Like, yeah. I, you hear me say this a bunch of times. There's a young woman in our community that is throwing events for men to have a voice, throwing events for young girls to like feel better about their image of themselves. 
who aren't backing these folks? Why are we just proud of them? And why aren't we yeah. doing everything we can to either get these people in better positions or protect them as they find their way and figure things out? And yeah. I think that's something that's very important. That's my biggest frustration with starting my nonprofit. Like, like you said, I'm not educated on business. I just like have a vision and I'm like, if these many people can do it, I'm sure I can figure it out, right? But like he said, the people are more like, oh, this is a great initiative. I love what you're doing. This is great, but I'm still struggling financially, even though I'm like soliciting donations. Nobody's yeah. willing to like actually yeah. put their money where their mouth is and support the mission. Yeah. Um, so I'm doing it out of pocket or, but, but like I'm thankful to have- Yeah, 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 but yeah I'm, I'm big, no, I'm not, but that's not, that's not a shoe. To you, yeah. I agree with like, that's how we started out. It was like, all right, we, we will figure it out. We figure it out every day. And I feel like we talked about this too. She was like, we made mistakes along the way. Mm -hmm. We didn't get to deep dive, but we I got touched you. on it. That's why I'm like, we got to have that talk. Yeah. I just want to say to encourage you, like, <clears throat> it's a process. And I wish somebody was in your space, take you by the hand, and walk you through it. Because that's why me and Keith are so quick to get back to other yeah. conditions. Like, this is what you need to do. I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you the whole game for it. Because a part of me, and I, I don't know where this comes from, it's not a bad place, but I feel like as I'm telling you the game and I look at your face, I can tell you're not going to do it. Like, based upon how you're reacting. I yeah. tell like, yeah, you, you feel like it's a lot. Yeah. And everything I told you is, it's a, it's a lot of repetitive work, mm -hmm. but it's not a lot. Like, when I tell people just the steps to get an LLC and like your articles or organization, your EIN, mm -hmm. they look at me and they're like, that sounds like a lot. That, that That's whole, not, no, that was the easiest part. That was the easiest part. <laughs> Everybody, your EIN is going to take you at best, if you're internet slow, to yeah. seven minutes. <laughs> seven minutes. And you get it in a month. You but, do, like, yeah. well, literally, and then I tell them, like, the long part will be waiting for the state of Maryland, if you want to get licensed in Maryland, to give you back your LLC. That's the yeah. longest part right there. And then from there, you set up a business account, set up a website, and it's just marketing, opening up there, yeah. like all that stuff. Like, I, I feel you. Because yeah. when we started, we were like, yeah. Anybody got that? We, we let her, we found one. Yeah. And she gave us a little bit of information, helped us along the way, but it's, it's, a, it's a hassle. And I think that that's a factor as to why, to what you're saying, we don't see a lot of us in certain spaces and feel like a part of it. I'm not saying it's true. It's like people start to view you as competition sometimes. And it always baffles my mind. Yeah. Silent competition. Yes. You don't know they're competing with you, but right. you see them every day. They're glad to see you. And that when you're gone, it's just that's the end of seeing you. Yeah. Yeah, and like, then, um, there's so many people out here that need help. You know, yeah, I can't say them all. Yeah, I need no, you. You're not supposed to. Hey, not build supposed your to practice. Just because, like, I go send them your way, man. There's a part of you that gets sacrificed in saving every single person that comes across your face. And she be saying that to me. Oh, she don't stop trying to save me. I'm not trying to. They were there, though. I just, I can't help it. Yeah. Not big about that. It's in front of me. That's a gift. Yeah. And that's yeah. better, though, because I hate one of my pet peeves now in this last, like, two or three months of, like, people coming up to me and saying, you know what you should do? You should. And I'm just like, well, why don't you help me do it? Like, I'll What you need to start saying is you should work for me. Or you should volunteer for me. I'll tweet it. Yeah. That too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boy, I have some to write it down for you. Yeah. But then it still puts it on me. So like, I just have so much that I'm already trying to do. Like, it's just put on her. Yeah. Like, um, can I share what I said to you when I was in New Jersey? And we have that talk about the not perfect number one. That's like working within the powerful. Try not to be too specific. Okay. Yeah. Um, when you start any business, this isn't just for nonprofit. Everything you guys are doing is volunteer. No matter who you are, no one's getting involved. Oh, we're all just here. It's all volunteer hours, period, right? Even the work we do now, this is volunteer. On camera, talking, chat, middle of the day, the sun on court or something like that. Volunteer, right? So that means that anyone that's willing to be a part of your business should be willing and open to the fact that they may have to do something a little bit extra outside of show up to meetings. So like, for example, she has some, she does have enough time. She's a doctor. She's currently working all the time. And being a doctor means you're going to deal with doctor pressure, not yeah. patients, coworkers, all yeah. that other stuff. Patients, the system yeah. not working correctly. So she may not be able to make calls. I said, Hey, on Thursdays, if possible, I'd be able to donate two to four hours of my time, make some calls and let me know what you need done. I'll see what I can do. I'm super busy, but I'm like, no, for you, yeah, okay. for you, I'm going to see what I can do. I don't like that. I don't wish it. Wait, they think you would. <laughs> 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 but 
for me, it's a privilege because it's like, hey, I have the time to be able to offer this to my friend. But there's other things other people could be doing that are part of what you're building. Mm -hmm. Where are they going to donate their time outside of what just their position is within the organization? Because this isn't going to make yourself. And if we're helping you to make more work for you to do, that means the work isn't going to done going to get done because you're just one person i like that juice because the reason why i doubt you also is because like i have the same philosophy like i'll work with other clinicians mm-hmm. like i like research and writing articles yeah and um and teaching and doing it so like other clinicians are here they'll be like and it's not to the same scale as yours they'll be like why don't we do an article together all right cool let's have a meeting talk about it. i have an old meeting with you i was i did a lot of i'll be like i'll create tell me what your vision is mm-hmm. I'll draft the outline, you tell me what you think. The draft the outline, they tell me what they think. I'll be like, cool, let's divvy up the sections then. I'll go ahead and send out the calendar advice that we check in and make sure we do it. I've done that with, and this is no shade to them, because I know they're busy. I've done that with four other clinicians about writing articles. They, I'll even follow up and be like, hey, do you want me to just work on your section for you to get a little more? I'm sorry, doc, please, cool, now nah, I'll get to it, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. And it just falls flat. And then when they see me, they're always like, I'm so sorry. I was like, I don't ever take it personally because I know you're busy. That's why I say, if you need help, let me know. Because I'm going to write my part of the article. It's yeah. all of it is. It's just data for me to use for the next article or the next book. But I'm willing to help you with your time right. because article writing for me, I guess this is giving insight to the field. I'm a contributing faculty member, an adjunct professor. I don't really mean much for me unless I was full time. If you're a full time faculty, you gotta publish, 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 right? I'll do an article with somebody because they'll come to me and be like, I wanna go do a TED talk or I wanna go do a presentation on this. And I tell them, well, you should write an article on it that way and get it published. That way you can be viewed as an expert on it to a certain degree. This may help you. Yeah. They've heard me say it before, so that's why they do it. And one thing I always try to do is, I always say this, if you need help in any part of this process, tell me. Yeah. It's going to take a little bit. It's going to take energy. Why didn't I get published for six months? But that's okay. Just let me know. I'll pick up a lot of the slack. And I even do them one better. I'll be like, you could put your name first on your article. Because having your name first, for those who don't know what an article means, the, the perception is, it's your article. You did all the work. You're the primary researcher because mm-hmm. this is, I'm trying to help your vision. Yeah. I want you to make it to where you need to go. And I now have a reason to do more research at that. Yeah. So that's why I was like, that's giving back to help people turn. Ooh, where the real ones? Wait, wait, man, man. Like, I don't need to get what you, I got. This has been another episode of Mental Health Monday. Appreciate you guys for pulling up. Enjoy Dr. B's time, Dr. Jones' time, Juice, we here. Like, subscribe, comment. Let's clap it up. All right, we're going to count it.